if the tech is ready. Uh oh, <laughs> everything is exploding. I just like standing with this thing, it's not blinding at all. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Hello, Internet. Okay. Okay, I'll just go. <laughs> I'll just stand here. <laughs> There we go. Hi, everybody. Well, thanks for our lunch and learn today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren Kopneski, and I'm a recruitment and admissions coordinator at the Stratford School of Interaction and Design and Business. So, how today's kind of going to go is Dr. Nathe is going to give his workshop on storytelling and design, and then I'm going to do a short um, presentation at the end about the Master of Digital Experience and Innovation, which is our master's program at the Stratford School. Um, we also have a few current MDEI students on hand today, so they're going to talk about their perspective of the program, so you are welcome to pick their brains if that's something you are interested in. Um, I'm going to pass the mic off to Jessica Thompson, who's the Associate Director of Graduate Studies, to introduce Dr. Nathie. Uh, so I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, my friend, Leonard Nake. Um, get comfy, he's done a lot. Uh, so Dr. Leonard Nake is an associate professor and the director of the HCIDH group at the University of Waterloo Institute. Institute. Uh, he teaches US, HCI, and game design at the University of Waterloo. He has recently shaped cognitive and emotional elements of player experience in video games while using physiological measures together with surveys and player interviews. Leonard is also interested in working with the implication, um, and he's also a user for experience design contractor. He served on the steering committee of the International Game Developers Association and Games User Research Special Interest Group, and is chair of the HCI Play Conference Steering Committee. He's been since 2014. His publications have won the Best Paper Honorable Mention, awarded to the top 5%, and the Best Paper Awards, awarded to the top 1%. At the premier HCI conferences, five in 2011 and CSCW 2012. He's published more than 100 scientific papers, which has been cited more than 7,000 times. He strongly believes in understanding users first to build more engaging games and compelling player experiences. So that's the official bio, but I'd like to add in some unofficial bio. Uh, Leonard has been a force at Stratford uh, since he joined us. Um, he is a uh, cross-point of the communication arts program, and he is our comrade in arms, always there to bring innovative ideas into the program, um, and he's willing to get in and help. Um, as director of the graduate program, I would like heavily on our faculty to tell us what's going on in the classroom, make suggestions and recommendations, etc., all of the goals making our program better. Leonard is literally my right hand. Um, we wouldn't be here where we are on the Thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> um, so, thanks, Jessica, for the awesome introduction. Welcome to this talk about storytelling and UX design. Um, and congrats to everyone for pronouncing my last name right. That was awesome. I know it's not easy. Um, yeah. So, storytelling and UX design. Two things I'm quite passionate about. Am I loud enough, by the way? Are we hearing it in the back row? Do you even need to hear it in the back row, or are the chips and the sandwiches good enough? Um, I see smiles, so that means you're probably hearing what I'm saying. Um, so storytelling in UX design, I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Before I talk about that, I want to give a big shout out to my ACI Games group, these amazing graduate students that I get to work with every day. I'm very excited uh, to uh, work um, with them. They're the best colleagues you can imagine in the world, and really they make every day uh, a, a pleasure to come to work. So thank you very much for being with me. All right, and some of them are here today. Um, hi. So stories. Uh, stories drive us. Stories kind of encapsulate us. Stories um, help us communicate, but stories also help us understand. Stories are 
a framework for everything that we do in life and in UX design, of course, as well. And so at the heart of it, Storm help us gather information about users, tasks, and goals. Uh, now, of course, uh, when we talk about user experience design, the question is, you know, like what, what is uh, user is sort of a, you know, it's not really a, a term that we like actually very much in that space. We like to talk about people because, you know, like user is just like somebody's interacting with something, right? Uh, so people that interact with stuff, uh, the tasks, so the things that they do and the, the goals they think that they want to achieve, that's the kind of stuff that we're um, excited about and that's the kind of stuff we want to tell stories about, okay? Stories also help us put a human face on analytic data, right? Often we get to create a lot of different data, uh, work with, uh, collect a lot of different data, um, you know, uh, just kind of by tracking the interactions that people do, uh, by listening to uh, the things that people say. Uh, all of this helps us generate data. As you know, we live in a world where it's really, really hard to opt out of the constant data stream that is our lives, right? Like when was the last time that you opted out of being on Facebook or being on Instagram or being on Snapchat or being on any of the social platforms that are out there? Uh, all of these things are for free, but as you know, freedom comes at a price. The price is that we hand over our data to these, to these things, right? And so data is something that is heavily used, uh, not just in experience design, but in any sort of tech company these days. So helping uh, tell stories with data is actually one of the powerful things. And I'll let you be the judge. You know, I have a whole different workshop on ethics in UX design, so I don't want to delve into that. Um, but I'll let you be the judge of, you know, what is the good and what is the bad about that. But at the end of it, if we don't have a story to tell with the data, the data is useless, right? So um, being able to tell stories with the data is one of the powerful things uh, that we can do um, if we employ stories as a UX design tool, okay? But stories also help us spark new design concepts and encourage innovation, right? Like uh, this nice little robot. I don't know if you've ever uh, re uh, read Jake Knapp's uh, book from Google Ventures about sprint and uh, the idea of design sprints. Who here is actually familiar with design sprints or has heard of design sprints? Like maybe one or two. Um, so. Design Sprints is this whole methodology that Google Ventures uses uh, to prototype products in a week, right? They take five days and they go from really crazy uh, initial idea towards an actual prototype and, and doing some testing with the prototype. And every day of the week has a theme and, and becomes a, a way of working towards that prototype. So really um, getting new design concepts, encouraging innovation is one of the things where he talks about all of those stories being used to build that kind of innovation, right? Like uh, thinking about, okay, so what is it that our prototype, that our product could actually do? Envisioning that in the first place. That's a story that you tell yourself, right? You start at some point, and I just constantly walk inside of that thing I just noticed because it's projecting on uh, <laughs> my body. So I should not walk around as much. Okay, it's good. Um, so one of the things uh, that we can that we can see here with these design concepts is we got to invent those concepts at some point, right? So uh, have you ever heard of this idea of futuristic uh, user interface design or uh, interface design inspired by the movies? Uh, some of you, and you know, that used to be something that people could relate to when I said, I said you saw Minority Report. Now it just tells you that I'm old because Minority Report is not really, you know, one of the recent movies that you've seen, but that was back in the day and Tom Hanks didn't actually age in that, uh, no, not Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise. He didn't actually age in that span since that movie was made. He still looks the same. But um, so the, the wonderful thing was like all of these interfaces that they had in that movie, they actually had user interface consultants come in and, and think about, okay, so what do we do? You know, they invented some of this gesture stuff before Connect actually brought it into our living room. That's kind of cool, right? Like somebody thought about that stuff. In a fictional context, we have this uh, thing called design fiction uh, where somebody just fictionalizes an interaction, and then we put it in, in the actual place. So stories really help in that idea of building these things, building the things in the first place. Stories also help us understand the world by giving us insight into people who are just not like us. This is paramount for if you want to become a user experience designer, right? Like there are t-shirts out there, if you ever heard about Norman Nielsen Group and some of the other, you know, UI, um, evangelists as we call them, uh, the the t-shirt essentially saying, you are not your user, right? Like, and again, the word user is, is 
weird, but yeah, you're not, you're not the person that's actually interacting with the thing. And this is the hardest step. And the DEI students that I work with, that was one of the first things in the first classes that I said, and I will keep saying that in every class, I will keep saying, you are not the person you're designing for. As we're going into our big design project, you have to remember that. You're designing for somebody else. This is so hard for us because we always have ourselves as a reference point. We are the anchor point that we, that we work from. So we're going from this anchor point that this is a worldview that we have. Well, what about all these other worldviews out there? So really, user experience design and user-centered design, at its heart, has to be interdisciplinary. It has to be multicultural. It has to be understanding. It has to be trans everything, transcendent almost, right? Like, you have to have an openness for all of these things. You cannot be a good user experience designer if you have a very channeled worldview. It will not help you. You have to put yourselves into other people's shoes. That is the wonderful thing and the challenging thing as well about being a user experience designer. And again, a story helps you tell these things. They become amplifiers. They become vehicles for us for understanding these other people. Oh, now I have insights into, into your life. What did you do this morning? What did you have for breakfast? You tell me that story. Now I understand a little bit better about your world. And I tell you my story about my breakfast that I missed this morning because I was rushing and <laughs> had to get to the car. But um, so, yeah, all of a sudden we have a deeper insight and understanding in other people that are not us, okay? Stories are also a strong way of sharing our ideas and creating a sense of shared history and purpose, right? This is really important as we go into design and specifically design in groups and teams. We need to have a shared purpose. Everyone needs to be on the same page. A story helps us communicate that. They help us communicate where we are, where we're going, where we've been. History, right? The story of us, the history, that is stories about the things that have happened. Studying history, as any history professor at the University of Waterloo would agree, is extremely helpful for us to understand where we are and where we're going to go. Understanding that really helps us shape a better understanding of the world around us. If we ignore history, if we ignore the things that have happened that led us here, then we will not be able to make very informed decisions about our future. Part of the world of, of data collection and data sharing if you think about your Fitbit, I'm currently like on a step challenge and I'm killing it right now because I'm just walking up and down. So one of the things that you can do in these shared data platforms is you can tell yourself a story of your data. You know what you've achieved that week. You wouldn't know that if that wasn't visible to you, if you couldn't tell yourself that story, if you couldn't make up a story of this history and the purpose that you've done. Okay, so the, some of these things, uh, social platforms, other, other things that we work with, actually tap into that idea that now we can have that shared history and purpose. Why do you think Facebook has that feature where it's just like three years ago and at first you're creeped out and you're like, whoa, that's not a good haircut. But you're, you're, you're seeing something that is your shared history. It's something that you wanted to share at that point helps you understand yourself. So stories tap into that. But stories can also persuade others of the value of your contribution. Again, a story is a vehicle. It can be a vehicle for you to convince other people of the power of your idea, of the innovativeness of your idea, of the actual, the, the, the drive that you're bringing to something, the contribution that you're bringing to a community. If you just do that and you never tell a story about it, you never you know, make it visible to people that way, it will not be successful. So again, stories are a tool for you to present that stuff. They're a tool for you to present yourselves even to others so that they understand what you have done the big communicator, but at its heart, and this is where stories become ultimately human, stories also create relationships. Why am I saying this is ultimately human? What is so human about relationships? Does anyone know? Like, why, why, why do we thrive on relationships as humans? Uh, because our basic drive is for connection. Like, our, we, like, we naturally attach, and that's the source of our suffering. Exactly. Like the source of our meaning. Exactly. This is where I tell you a story um, that, you know, might be a little bit uncomfortable to, to hear, uh, but a story about uh, a mass murder that happened in Norway a couple of years ago. Um, I forgot the name of the shooter, but there was a shooter at an island and, and a shooting 
a couple of uh, help. I think it was high school students uh, in Norway and like like shooting people like really atrocious crime, right? Like we're talking about a mass shooting, and to that date, not really common in Europe. If you go to the U.S., these things are way more common and have been for a longer time. But in Europe, this was a thing that everyone was just like, "What happened?" Uh, so then, a couple of years later, on television, I see this documentary about uh, this mass shooter that's now in a, in a Norwegian island prison. So he's on an island by himself, mind you, with prison guards protecting that island. He's on an island, and it looks like paradise, and it looks like, man, this guy's got it good. He's like, there's like lush, like we're talking Denmark here, that's a beautiful country. It's a little cold by Canada, but uh, there's like nice nature there, right? So all of that solace in that nice nature, but then they interviewed him. And he was crying, and he was having the hardest of times. And, and uh, they also interviewed a Norwegian uh, a prison person that was kind of explaining that, because obviously the media had questions about, like, what is this Norwegian prison system it's supposed to be a punishment? Um, but I'm seeing all these, these wonderful, these nice amenities here. And then the guard just cleverly said that their belief is that the worst punishment for a human being is to be socially isolated. And so that was the, the whole point that they put in there, is social isolation. He has nobody that will talk to him, nobody that will interact with. He's just basically in isolation. Sure, he's on an island, but there's no human interaction. The worst possible, according to a no, to Norwegian uh, philo philosophy paradigm, the worst possible punishment for a human being is being alone, having no human connection. It's interesting, right? Like it makes you think about that stuff. It makes you think about, you know, like why, why do prisons exist in the first place and all that stuff. But it is an interesting thing to think about that the worst thing we can imagine as humans is not to be able to connect. Like connections do drive us. We are social animals. And at the heart of it, we want to connect with other people. And stories help us create these connections. Now you have a little bit of insight after I told you the story in the Norwegian prison system. And you can bring your own evaluation and your reflection onto that. But we've just created a relationship between me and you. I've told you the story. You probably, you can Google it. You can look up some of the facts. You can build upon it. You have a foundation that creates a relationship that we can uh, work from. So that's very interesting. Stories are, as drivers of that relationship, but also as big connectors, right? Like who's ever been to a campfire that's, you know, uplift the mood a bit because people are just trying <laughs> to look at the prison. Okay, so who's been to a campfire and roasted some marshmallows and shared a story about high school? Probably, you know, a couple of people, no? Let's go in the summer, no? Okay, um, really beautiful, right? Like going on a campfire, maybe even singing together. Back in the day, the, the tales that the bards actually did, it wasn't so much about singing. What did a bard do? Do you, do, does anyone know what a bard is? So the bard was a storyteller, and they would, like, the thing is that it was oral histories, so they didn't have a lot of writing, so they had to memorize everything. Exactly. And they did that to set a magical song. Yeah, exactly. Very, very important uh, for communication, for history keeping as well, oral history, um, but, but also to create those connections, right? Like, they weren't just musicians, but they were creating people through these stories and had to, of course, memorize these stories and transcend these stories. Now, the interesting thing is that, of course, stories also mutate, right? Like, we can only talk about the game of telephone. Who here hasn't played telephone or doesn't know what telephone is? Okay, everyone has sort of had some exposure to telephone. Uh, uh, so the idea is, right, like, a story is presented by one person, but then a story is, is never like uh, a fact, right? Uh, a story uh, and even like a fact you could argue, but a story is never like, I, I have this cord and I give this cord to you. It's not like an artifact, it's not like a thing in the real world. It's ephemeral by nature, right? I'm telling you the story and it evaporates after I've told it to you, it's already there. What it does is it goes into your head and you could go into the psychology of things, but you do a whole lot of processing in your own mind. So essentially I'm telling you this story, purpose story, and this is the story that's in your head. That's the story that you're understanding. I just told you the prison story. Depending on your background, you have a whole different story in your head than the one that I wanted to articulate to you. Because again, you're coloring it already as you're comprehending it with everything that you have and that makes you up as an individual person. Aha. Uh -huh. So again, it's this important understanding for us as UX designers to understand everyone is different. Everyone interprets things differently. We need to understand that difference. We need to look into how these stories work. Of course, Ideally, then we have some sort of interaction between the storyteller and the storyteller, uh, 
at least was that, well, this is a story listeners um, so that in that interaction you can then um, try and come to a more streamlined version of that story you can have questions and answers and you can try and really corroborate that and you end up with you know the slightly more streamlined story but it's still colored by your individual experiences so again the most important relationship is between the audience that listens to the story and the storyteller in that case, right? Like that's the relationship that's built right away. So what's a story? What makes a story? What makes a, an interesting story? Well, a story, first of all, it can be written or spoken. As we said, back in the days, we actually didn't have proper means of, of writing it down. I mean, we started drawing on the walls as cavemen and trying to get an idea of how to communicate some of these things. but. In terms of writing, what was the big invention? There's a lot of you know, contest about that if you go into Asian history. There's a couple of people arguing that uh, in some uh, Asian countries, some of the printing press was actually invented before a certain person. Who was it? He was German. <laughs> Gutenberg, yeah. So he, uh, <laughs> he popularized it with the bestseller at the time. It was called The Bible. Uh, sort of a big uh, book, Old and New Testament and stuff in it. Uh, and so, uh, of course, this was a thing where clergy back in the day did a lot of documenting, right? They did a lot of handwriting. And so you had, if you've ever watched Game of Thrones and you've seen like the guy, like he, he goes out, it's like season six or seven and he just like writes stuff, like right? that's, that's what the clergymen back then used to do or the maesters as they're called in Game of Thrones or the people in the fortresses, right? Like, but they used to just do a lot of copy and pasting because we didn't have a copy machine. Well, that's not very flattering, you know, to be a copy machine. It's like, that's your life, you're a copy machine. But um, so essentially what he did is he's essentially trying to use that uh, new invention of his that he can um, then help us spread these stories more quickly. Now that we have the printed press, uh, these stories can be generated um, in the hundreds and they can be shipped out and multiplied much quicker. Now the next big thing has happened after that, after the printing press, was what? And that can't be pinpointed to like a single person or something. That was more of a gradual change, but it was, of course, the internet and then the mobile internet today, right? Like nowadays, information is as fast as it's being created. It is seen around the world. Hello, Facebook. Hello, live stream. It is seen everywhere. You know, it's not just the people in this room, but now this information is, is as it's being built, it's comprehended and, and reproduced so quickly, uh, we hardly have a time to actually make sense of it, right? So it's really interesting to look, look at, okay, stories can be written or spoken, but also there's another way of storytelling as we're doing it right now, through pictures, moving images, or words, right? And we can see that, of course, the moving images part in the theater, it can be done through pictures, like that, uh, that furry dragon is uh, sort of a, you know, that's a, Definitely, you, you know the never ending story, hopefully. Somebody? No? Oh, okay, you should check it out if you haven't seen it. There was actually in Stratford, where the wonderful uh, DI program is located, they had that uh, on, um, uh, they, they actually had a great um, interpretation of that in the theaters there. Uh, so that was last year. So oh, one of the benefits in Stratford is lots of theater there, lots of awesome stuff. And, um, but then there's also something like that, where you're trying to use um, words because these are just words and post-it notes, words as storytelling. And this is interesting because, again, it can be something that relates to you as a person. And all of our different experiences form the story, right? Like something like this prompt. I'm a woman on a mission to, and then everyone can put a sticky on there. And all of a sudden, you become this temperament of all the women in the room and kind of get an idea, oh, this is kind of what we, right now, kind of want to achieve. So you, you're really helping people tell their own story and merging them. And of course, we have these kind of stories that can be told live or through recorded uh, audio or video. Uh, great show, by the way, if you have Apple TV. Um, so some stories are just live, right? They, they're, not, um, they're not something that uh, you know, we have sort of uh, in a theater or something, but it's something that happens live. It can be broadcast, it can be uh, recorded, it can be um, reproduced right away. Uh, so sort of a specification of the moving image. And stories can have a beginning and a middle and an end. And that's sort of the classic story structure. Greek guy kind of started this. Anyone know the name? I want to name drop some history knowledge right here. Uh, have you ever heard of Aristotle's Poetics? Um, and sort of the classic three-act um, three structure. 
um, where you have you know beginning, middle, and end. So you have three acts, and then later you, you, we looked at you know plot arches and, and other things where it just kind of becomes a little bit more um, detailed. But really, um, this is sort of the, the classic way that we're enjoying stories. We're enjoying some sort of exposition at the start, we're starting off with something, and then we're getting into the nitty gritty, and then we're wrapping things up at the end. As an academic, most of the articles that I write are the same way. You know, I gotta set it up in terms of, you know, this is quite a research question we have to analyze, and then whoop, 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 here's some experiments, whoop, science in your face, and then at the end, it's just like, yeah, cool, we found out this, I hope you can take something home with you. Uh, so it's just kind of this nice structure. Or it can be a story where it's just the time and the place. That's interesting. Sort of, you know, just kind of these kind of observer stories. Haha. -ha. As a UX researcher, this is one of the things that you're going to get really good at. It's being in a place over time, observing the things that happen. As the students in my class know, that because they've already done this exercise, uh, where they had to sit in a, in a, in a coffee uh, shop, in a cafe, and they had to just kind of observe what was going on. It's a time and it's a place, so it's a, you know, a time span that they had, and then they're just observing what's happening in that place and what's going on. What are the stories that are happening in that, in that location, right? Like an interesting way for us to understand what's going on. Very cool. But stories also help us close a gap, right? So again, we have this way of looking at the UXer or the UX researcher and the users and the audience, and so essentially the user tells us a story, we as a UX person are collecting that story, but then our colleagues, maybe if you have a couple of observers there, are also telling that story, and that interaction, that discussion, retelling each other the story, retelling each other the same observation, or maybe the same interview that we were part of, makes for a really interesting amalgamation and, and closing the gaps that we might have missed in our own interpretation. Again, connectors, big social connectors, but also big connectors of if we're missing any information. This is why we say it would be good to get a second set of eyes on something, right? Because now we're wanting to fill in that gap. We've told the story, we've understood the thing from our perspective, but that second set of eyes will help us close that gap. It will help us build a better story. But also, good stories usually have characters. Characters are at the heart of it. What are characters in the story? What do we usually have? Okay, let's think about it in terms of Star Wars old and Star Wars new. Star Wars old, things were really nice and black and white and easy to understand, except for that time when George Lucas decided to edit Han Solo shooting, right? That, that was sort of controversial, but a lot of Star Wars fans in the room, not really, everyone's just kind of, what's this Star Wars thing he's talking about? Um, so that's a popular movie series about stars and wars and, you know, like androids and like lightsabers, anyways. Um, so, just to wrap things up for the non-geek in the room, uh, in the original Star Wars, we had basically a good guy and a bad guy. Good guy, called Luke Skywalker, had like a lightsaber and had to do some sort of, you know, fact-finding missions about his upbringing. And then the bad guy, Darth Vader, who turns out was actually the father to the good guy. Sorry to spoil it if you haven't seen it. But, um, okay, so then good and bad clash, right? So a good story, in that case, a story that sold millions, started a franchise, maybe even a religion for some people, um, has exactly that. It has a, a, what we call a protagonist and then an antagonist. So somebody that pushes things forward and then somebody that pushes it back, creating friction. We like friction. We like friction in stories, right? Like, this is great. What would happen if we just had a protagonist? If we just had a good guy? That make for a good story. Would it be interesting? It would be boring. Would be boring. Good guy gets up, gets out of bed, everything happens. Two good guys, it's all great. No opposing forces, great. You know, it's like when we have a really good day. But apparently us having a really good day doesn't make for a really good story because, and this is probably why we said, well, today was kind of boring. But you know what, it was still a good day. But would I tell somebody about that day? Not really. This is also why probably we tell more people about the things when we had a bad day. Because when we had a bad day, there was some opposing force, right? That now we want to tell the story. Now it's interesting because now we have that, you know, that working of antagonist and protagonist. Interesting. So these characters are really what makes uh, good, interesting stories. If we have main characters and, and villains and all that stuff. And I'm not going to, I was going to go into this whole Kylo Ren thing, but I'm just going to leave it for later. So if anyone wants to chat about that later and why that's not a black and white character, spoiler alert, we can do that after the talk. Okay.
So good stories have a time and a place. I already said that, right? Like good stories like can happen in a time and a place, but now if we're already in a time and a place, like if you would have done that observation, but you knew during that observation Justin Bieber would walk into that cafe, you would already have either protagonist or antagonist, depending on your personal preference there, but you'd already have something that makes the story more interesting, right? So good stories have that kind of time and place, but they also have these characters, okay. But also good stories have events. Now we're at the holy trifecta of user and task, right? Like so user and task, and then what did I say at the start? user and task and the interaction between the user and the task. So an event essentially makes it happen that there is uh, somebody going into uh, so, so some form of uh, time and place, and now that person has to have an interaction in that time or place, and that's what we call an event. So that action that's happening, that's actually the interesting thing that you want to record as a user researcher. But then good stories also trigger emotions. Now this is where we're getting to the sort of magical user experience part we were trying to understand, okay, so what does that mean? What does it mean to have these kinds of emotions? It means now we're getting a little bit of a better understanding of why something is happening. Why is that event taking place? These emotions help us understand things, you know? In terms of Star Wars terms, when we found out that Darth Vader is the father of Luke, sorry, um, then all of a sudden we had certain emotions in place because now we have a relationship there that we weren't aware of. This is old father-son dynamic going on, okay? Good stories tap into that. They tap into these human emotions. And what do humans feel a lot of emotions about is, of course, about our personal connections, about that connectedness. So at the heart, good stories also have these interactions. And in UX, we can, of course, model these interactions. And this is sort of an idea of, sort of some of the storyboards or interaction modeling. So OK, hands down, what do we then actually use stories in UX for? Well, a protagonist, as I said, good stories have emotions, but also Good stories help you kind of shape an interesting protagonist. Whoa, Siri, what are you? Siri says, I don't understand, you have shaved. OK. Um, <laughs> thank you, Siri. Um, <laughs> obviously, Siri also has empathy for me. Um, so a protagonist needs empathy. So the idea being that um, we want to uh, cluster our user in a way that helps us relate to that user. A way to do that is, of course, empathy mapping. There's a standard technique in UX design that you will learn in the DEI program and uh, that it will be quite helpful for your, um, for your interactions. So the things that a user says, the things that they think, that they did, and that they felt, all of that stuff can be mapped upon a, a better understanding of what that user actually looks like. And then, of course, we have this thing about user stories. Like, user stories are a way for us to tell things about data segments that we have. So we have these certain user roles uh, or personas, which are then just uh, audience segments, um, basically just representations of bits of data. And so as that person, I want to, and then you want to achieve a goal, so I can, and you give a reason. So these are interesting things, because now you're saying, OK, these are the types of users that I have, the roles. That's what they want to achieve, and this is why they want to achieve it. That's very powerful. As you're telling yourself these stories, you're actually getting an understanding why people want to interact with your system. As a job, as a job seeker, I want to search for a job so I can advance my career. Makes sense, okay? So if I'm designing the new monster website, um, then I, of, of course I want to look into that. I want to see, okay, they want to search for that because they want to advance their career. So maybe we can work on that. But as a recruiter, maybe I want to have a different view on the same website. I want to post a job vacancy and so I can find a new team member. So there's different desires, different drives. Maybe I should design for different views. Okay, and different ways of looking at our user interaction. That's the key when you're designing a new system, thinking about what do people actually want to do with it? What do they want to achieve? You're building tools for people to get stuff done, not for people just to enjoy the tool. That would make no sense. And at that part, you're looking at a more detailed, what we call user journey. And uh, again, user journeys is kind of, this is this wonderful thing that you've probably seen, Freitex Pyramid, uh, the idea of, okay, every plot structure kind of follows this. Any Nicholas Sparks romance novel that you've seen, they're all the same way, right? Like, you know, people arrive in Little Fisher Town or whatever. Uh, okay, bad things happen. I didn't tell you this. Lies and deceit or whatever. Woof, we can't fall in love. And then at the end, okay, I understand. This was the reason why you did that. 
cool, now we're a couple, okay? So a lot of Roman stuff just kind of follows this basic plot structure. So there's an exposition, we get to know the characters, then there's something that happens, something that you didn't foresee, and that kind of makes things a bit complicated. And this complication rises. The rising action is essentially a complication of the things that's happening. Usually it's something with a lack of information that's provided to another party. Luke didn't know Darth Vader was his father, had to wait an entire movie to find out. Okay, so that's a complication. And then you come to a crisis, okay? Uh, a, a fight or something, in, in, uh, in video games specifically. Um, and then usually there is a climax. Uh, there's some sort of moment when you start to understand, ah, this is, I can now see the solution. I can now flip this from being a problem towards a resolution where I solve it. And then you go through the, what we call the denouement and then the end. And of course, for user experience design, you could do the same thing, where essentially you describe the current state of your system. You look at, okay, there was a problem, action there. Okay, this is what makes it complicated, or this is what makes it work, but there are steps that, that bring it forward. And then we reach an impediment, something that prevents us from doing that. And then we solve the problem. And then what? We've met the goals. How do we keep going? So that's one way of telling it. But then we also have this idea of user scenarios. So scenarios as an idea can be about users, their work, the environments, and how they do the tasks the tasks that they need to do, and the combinations of all of these. So really, user scenarios are little story bits that we can tell about the people that we're designing for. So really, if you look at it, storytelling is already everywhere in UX. It's when you collect all the data, it helps you eliminate the data during the analysis as you're looking at interviews and, and data bits. It helps you understand the UX team. The UX team talking to each other provides a, a common design idea. It helps you communicate that design idea to your audience. It helps you make good scenarios for testing the tasks. And in the end, you go back to collecting input. Like it's all there, it's all in our iterative cycle of design. It's already inherent that we understand stories. <clears throat> so really, the main purposes are we get to meet the users where they're at. We can illustrate the user needs, the points of pain. We can brainstorm with stories. We can tell success stories about our app. We can explore the design, or we can go into the task of um, evaluating the design that we have. All of these things can be told, told through stories. And then, of course, a way of doing that is what's called user story mapping. And this is like, if you wanna, I'm gonna hop over it real quick, but if you wanna know the details, there's a great book about this, and it's a really powerful tool because it helps you kind of focus on what is the user experience like as a sort of a storyline on the whiteboard. Uh, because essentially what you're doing is you're breaking it down into big steps. In the left to right flow, there's usually this temporal flow, and then you talk and write down the details under each step. So you're explaining each of the steps, right? And like if we did an exercise, it would be something like where you're describing what did you do this morning? You know, I got out of bed and then I washed my hands and all that stuff. So those are all the steps. And then you provide the details. And then you think about, so what are the bigger steps? So in UX design, we often do this thing called affinity mapping. We're just like, okay, these are the big things. And now these are all the small things that trickle down under that, okay? And so you have that same level of detail and story mapping. We have sort of the... The, the above water idea, and then you have all where the fish are swimming under the water, sort of this, this trickle down. You have the surface, we have, okay, these are sort of the bigger steps that I'm doing, but these are all the subtasks that I have to do. Now, why would you have to do that? Because this is kind of how that looks like in the end. I have this big map, and then you can even pin personas on the start, on the, on the top, so that you can tell the stories for the people. Um, because now, now I can kind of see all of the levels of it. I can see the big picture of my app or my system that I'm building, but I can also break down all of the interactions that need to be there. So this is, again, important when we're designing this stuff because we know the backbone, the major narrative flow, the things that we can pitch to our users, but we also can see, oh, these are all the tasks. This is the stuff we need to design for. This is how we understand the user goals. Excellent. Okay, here are some references in case you're interested more in that stuff. This is a great book. A lot of the content is coming from the storytelling for user experience. Um, there's a couple of interesting websites about that. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry we didn't have more time. I hope you had a good time. Tell me a story about your life after this presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I can take that. Thanks, Leonard. I'm just going to put my little MDI presentation up here. Please stick around if you have time. Sorry, I should have asked you about the exact time. I wasn't sure. Do you want to learn more about the program? Do you want to do that? We also have our MDI students. Because I saw you. Actually, because I'm
finished early. That was my five minute. Oh, oh well. well still good. <laughs> All right, so I know I see a lot of familiar faces here today, which is awesome. If you don't know anything about the Master of Digital Experience Innovation, I'm going to chat about it a little bit. So the program foundation is, is kind of based on a few different topics, one of which being UX design, which ties into what Leonard was just chatting with you about today. So in this program, you will learn the fundamentals of UX research and design. You're also going to learn about digital marketing, um, specifically in the kind of a more teaching and learning coordinated 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 coordinated. It's more asynchronous anyways. So I guess they're kind of taking the course, but they're still doing the second How digital media and digital the marketing can support the growth of business in this field. Great project-based learning program. Uh, it's, it's wonderful because a lot of our faculty who teach the program are also industry professionals so you kind of get in the best of both worlds and very up-to-date information on the content being taught. Uh, we have access to a lot of tech in this program, which I'll talk more about briefly in a second. Um, but again, it's a very, it's a smaller program and it's very much a team uh, project learning-based program. If you're wondering where this program takes place, it is at our Stratford Satellite Campus, which is in Stratford. Um, this is a shot, an exterior shot of our building. Um, the building was opened in 2012, so it's very new and shiny still. Um, we have a number of project rooms throughout the building. Um, because this program is so heavily uh, based on group work, we have lots of spaces throughout the, the building that students can use to work. Um, we also have something called Media Services, which is basically a lending library for tech. So any students, um, you can just swipe your law card and you can check out any um, tech that you might need for projects. And you can use any tech if you just want to learn more about it. And it's kind of more of a passion project or a hobby. Um, we have all of the latest cameras, laptops loaded with Adobe Creative Suite. Lighting kits, tripods, audio equipment, basically anything you can think of, you are able to rent for free from media services. Again, we are located in Stratford. If you've never been to Stratford before, I would encourage you to take a visit. It's a very cute little town, um, and it's surprisingly for its size, it's full of lots of culture. Yeah? Just wondering, uh, can you rent those uh, equipment if you're not part of uh, the. Uh, Pardon me? Can you rent those equipment from the library? So the media services is solely for GDA students, full business and digital arts, which is our undergrad, and our master's students. It's reserved for them. All right. Um, so Stratford is a very cute little town, lots of restaurants. We are home to the Stratford Festival Theater, which is North America's largest repertory theater, home of Justin Bieber, in case anyone's a huge fan here. <laughs> And how the program is structured for includes available in full time and part time. For the full time program, you will do semester one of academic study, you'll be able to take four courses, then you'll do semester two, four courses again, and then the third semester is spent solely working on the capstone project to round off the degree. So during the capstone project, you will work in teams with your fellow MDX students. Um, and you will be matched with a company. These are just some of the companies that we've worked with in the past, and that list really does change and expand um, every year. But you will be matched with someone from the company, and they will present to you some sort of challenge that they anticipate facing in the future, and your project will be designing a solution for that challenge. Um, so it's, it's really a great way to kind of take what you've learned in the last two semesters and apply it in hands-on very real way. So for the admission requirements, we are looking for an honors bachelor degree with a minimum overall average of 78% in the final two years of the degree. Um, that's kind of the main component of, of your application. You will also need to submit three references, and they can either be three academic references or two academic references and one professional reference. Um, you'll also submit your resume and a 300 to 500 word statement of interest, which is essentially you just saying what do you see yourself taking away from the program and how, how you feel you can contribute to the program. Um, while I'm kind of on this topic, 
a lot of people kind of get deterred. They think they have to have all of this industry experience in order to be eligible. That's not necessarily true at all. We accept applicants who come from all different backgrounds. Um, so if you have a bachelor degree in something that you may not think is super, super relevant, you don't think you have enough experience, again, that's not necessarily true. Don't let that intimidate you from applying for the program. If you are interested in touring the Stratford School and learning more about the program, you are welcome to book a tour. Um, we generally run tours from Monday to Friday all year round. And you can book a tour through me. If you don't have my email, um, all my information is on the website and my card is over there. Um, and now I think we'll invite our MDI students up to chat more about the program from their perspective.
twice a week. And so uh, three hours plus another uh, three hours per course for coursework? Or so it would depend on uh, sort of the, the point in the semester. It's not dissimilar from your undergraduate studies, right? Depending on where you are in the term. Um, I mean, you want to add potentially commuting time onto that as well, right? So I'd rather from Waterloo to Stratford to speak. But um, I mean, I would say three hours uh, on average per course throughout the term is not unreasonable as an expectation. And then if you're doing project-based work um, or something, you're learning something new, then that might um, contribute to, to your course hours as well. Okay. Does anyone have questions about group work? Because I know that can be very intimidating to a lot of people. Um, so the group work's not actually that bad. There is a lot of group work in the program, but in like the first semester, one of the things you learn is how to work in teams and work together. And you're with a bunch of people that are there to work in teams together to get that high mark. So it's not a I find it's not at all like working in teams in undergrad, where there's like one person doing all the work and then one person slacking off in the corner pretending that they did something. Um, in this program, there's actually a lot of teamwork, so everybody's learning how to do stuff together. Um, so it's a lot easier, it's a lot more fun. Almost all of the school, um, every single floor, there's group uh, work rooms. And all the walls you can write on, all the windows you can write on, so it's really a place that um, is for creativity and brainstorming and collaboration. And just building on that, for anybody who is working right now or who um, has like sort of freelance or passion projects that you're working on, I have found that the majority of what I'm learning is directly applicable to the work that I'm doing. Um, in my day job, so uh, for me, the, the returns on that were so high, sort of right off the bat, that I was able to take what we were learning in, in our classes and apply it to my job, whether that's the sort of creative and communications elements of my job, or even just the working in teams elements of my job, right? Um, so, uh, in terms of ROI, I'm already kind of experiencing that. Uh, so, we're going to move on to have you gone to any job fairs or anything like that since you started? Yes. How was that? What was that like? So, um, it depends on the job fair because there's certain people there that are looking for certain jobs. So it's always good to look beforehand to see if there's anyone there that's presenting jobs that you're interested in going in, depending on how many people employers are there presenting jobs that you're interested in, depends on the success point of that job fair. So I know last semester we went through to the P for D job fair, and there wasn't that many people looking for project managers or UX designers or digital marketers. They're mostly looking for software engineers. Um, I found out went to the Tech Jam. It was another job fair, and there were people that were looking for project management. Um, it just also depends on the timing of the job fair, because if you go in December looking for a job when you're done school in August of next year, you're going to find a little more friction, but there is some opportunity. You just have to be able to, to find it, look for it, and have the right time for the opportunity. Another place we've gone is uh, conferences, so like the Fluxical Conference, which is a big events conference, where you do find people there that are employers for the work. And besides from that, um, the people that you speak to when you mention the program that you're studying, they're like, oh, someone that did that that's working here with us and everything. So there's already that recognition. So when you come in, they don't want to expect, they're not surprised, and they're kind of excited to have you there. And you also get a lot of slag at job fairs, so that's a lot of fun too. We got Google Socks, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions that we can answer in sort of the group setting? Um, because I, I think we'll stick around for a few minutes if there have any questions particular to our experiences or the courses. Um, just so sure you can speak to Lauren and Jessica and, and Leonard. Um, uh, at least I'll stick around for a bit and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have now or give you my contact information for any questions you may have down the road. Okay. <laughs>